Let's pray together. God, those words just hit our ears so funny. God, what, a, what an incredible song, but Lord, the wonderful cross. How could, how could an instrument of death, of, of punishment, be wonderful? But Father, today and this week more than any other of the year, God, I just pray that, that you would help us to see the beauty and the sacrifice. God, I ask that you would help us to understand that, that we don't have the table. We don't have the bread and the juice. We don't have forgiveness for our sins. Unless there's the cross. Unless there's death. Unless there's payment. And so, Father, today in the name of Jesus, I just pray that you would not only invite us and cause us to see that and know that and experience that in a more powerful way, maybe than ever before, but God, I just pray that you would help us to lean into that, God, to live into that in ways greater than we ever have before as well. So Father, we thank you for the gift of the wonderful cross. God, we give you this time, we give you our lives, and we ask that you would speak to us today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. good morning. That was good. I want you guys to know I missed you last week. I actually, uh, uh, Bethany and I, uh, we did a marriage retreat Friday and Saturday. And Sunday morning, I spoke in my uh, friend's church in Pennsylvania. And, uh, and I love my, my friend, my brother, and uh, great people in his church. But, but most things about being there caused me to wish that I was here. So uh, love you guys, and it's awesome to be, uh, to be home. Uh, well, we are in the uh, third week of our Easter series entitled Blood. Dun, 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 dun. And uh, week one was just such uh, an awesome time where we talked about this idea that's such a simple idea, but I think changes things where when we have physical problems, we should bring physical solutions, right? And when we have emotional problems, we should bring emotional solutions, and if we have practical problems, we should bring practical solutions, because as people of faith, far too often, we try to bring spiritual solutions to everything, and a lot of times that just doesn't work, but as we are bringing our physical and emotional and, and practical solutions, we need to bring those remembering that the blood of Jesus courses through our veins as royal priests, right? We are part of the priesthood of all believers. And we need to do things with that kind of belief and intensity, knowing that what Jesus did in his blood changes absolutely everything. That's good news, right? And then last week, Roy talked to us. Wasn't that a great message? That was awesome. And I love, I just love, and we've talked about this, guys, but I, I love that that we have more and more people who are passionate about communicating God's word and who are committed to doing it at a higher and a higher level. And equally as important, I love that you guys are, are, are loving that more and more too. That's incredible because if we have one or two people that can do that, we are a weak church. But if we have more people who are called and passionate, we become stronger and thank you so much. I, I, we hadn't been back an hour, and I heard from like a dozen people about how great it was, and I love that. It's just incredible. And so we talked about this idea of how when blood is shed, when blood is shed and hits the ground, the scriptures talk about this, that it stains the ground, that there's this curse from spilling blood. And so the scriptures, God commands us not to do that, and he says that, that if it happens, there's only one way to repay that spilled blood. It's by the shed blood of the one who spilled it, which is heavy. And we have a lot of stains in a lot of places in our culture. And we should be so thankful that because it's Jesus' blood as followers who have been washed and cleansed and filled, Jesus' blood courses through our veins, so ultimately his blood pays the price for all of us. What incredible news is this? And as we continue talking about blood, I want to remind you that we are talking about actual blood. Not conceptual blood or metaphorical blood, but the real thing. We are actually talking about actual blood. And didn't we deal with blood, actual blood, the real thing, in a pretty cool, 
relevant, practical way this week? Yeah? Yeah, let me show you one picture. Uh, <laughs> woo! There's my lovely wife. And it's interesting because I don't know if you donated um, and, uh, and maybe you're nervous about donating, and you, but you tried to do that or did that. Uh, Bethany, when she got here and she was kind of part of the first crew, and Willie there, the guy who's helping her, here's the first words he said to her. My name's Willie, and I bring the pain. Now, I don't think it was a painful experience, was it? No, okay. Maybe psychologically, but not physically. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, if you're nervous at all, that's not what you want to hear, right, about Willie bringing the pain. Um, can, I have like a, can I have a moment of, of sort of more than usual honesty? Is that all right? <laughs> uh, Sandy, is that cool with you? All right. Um, next time I speak somewhere else, I want to bring you with me too, by the way. I need more, I need, always need more energy. I like that. That's good. Uh, we had about 20 to 25 percent of our church sign up and give blood, which, which is awesome. It's awesome. It really is. Um, and, but here's the thing, and I think part of it is that I'm an extrovert, <laughs> and part of it is that I'm an optimist, and I have a faith gift, right? It's one of my spiritual gifts. So, so like, I'm like, this is really, really cool. But real, I mean, and I, I mean, some of us can't, right? Some of us have medical things or like serious. That's great, but really, like, I just I, here's what I kept thinking. It's really cool, and I'm going to share some stats with you a little bit later that are amazing. But is there any reason half of us couldn't have done that? I mean, it's such an easy, practical, simple thing that changes and saves lives, like now. So I was a little bit discouraged, right? I'm like a little bit bummed that like we couldn't have had half of us or 60 percent of us like do this thing. The changes things. It, it was no different. Three and a half years ago at our 10th anniversary, and, and we actually took, you guys remember the little church? We took a special offering, a 10th anniversary offering, and, and we, t- we talked about it every Sunday for three months leading up to that. I had all sorts of people saying, Rob, we just came out of summer. Summer's always tough financially. Are you sure you want to take a special offering and give it all away to church planting? And I'm like, yeah. Like, we wouldn't exist if people hadn't sacrificed, right, for us so that we could do all the things we've been able to do. And so let's do this, guys. And I sort of challenge people. It's like maybe you could do more, maybe you can't do that. But, like, think about it. What if everybody gave $1,000, 100 bucks for every year we existed as a church, just as a special sacrificial thing? Bethany and I did that. Um, and in uh, that one Sunday, we had $22,000 come in that we gave away for church planting, which was awesome. Our regular offering that same weekend was 18000 We had $40,000 come in in a day. That's a lot of money, right? That's, that's awesome. But with four to 500 of us hanging out and like 20-ish of us sort of taking the challenge, and again, I know some people, you know, a bunch of people sort of did less, and that's totally fine, but I'm like, oh, like, because here's the thing, I just, I'm always thinking about, about this, like, as we can, and as we continue talking about this fascinating substance called blood that is the worst and the best, it's repelling and it's vital all at the same time, I'm reminded about how Jesus gave it all for us, and how we get lazy, and how we give excuses, how we underperform, and how much more we could do and should do, and how much better we should be because of his very real blood that was shed painfully for us. And here's the thing, she's like, Rob, Rob hey, come on, this is like, this has been a good series, and, and you know, we're heading toward Easter, we're going to celebrate resurrection, this is like kind of heavy, right, this is kind of a downer, but here's the thing, this week of all weeks, shouldn't, shouldn't it, we feel it a little heavier? I mean, shouldn't this be a little darker, a little more challenging, the weight, the heaviness? Because here's the thing. Can you imagine being Jesus, knowing that you're entering the last week of your life? Knowing that you were born to die. I can't imagine the stress, the pressure, the weight of that. And if we as his followers want to walk in his path, there are times where we should share in that weight as well. Amen? And so, so you know, uh, many of you have seen WWJD, right? It was even referred to in the, the video that we watched up top this morning. What does that mean? What would Jesus do? Well, I actually think there's a better 
question to ask. I think the better question is WDJD. What does WDJD stand for, do you think? What did Jesus do? Because what would Jesus do is kind of a speculative thing, isn't it? It's like, hmm, I think Jesus would order the extra large pizza, right? Like, we just kind of make stuff. Like, what would, I don't know what Jesus would do, right? Like, there, we can kind of guess. But, but what did Jesus do is powerful. And it's not that because he did it means it's that, that's exactly what he wants to do again or right now. But it, if we see that, all the things Jesus did, it at least gives us this range of, of activity to think within and to, to work within and to live within. And so in keeping with our series, I want to look at what Jesus did by talking through what we see him doing in John chapter 6. So today we're going to walk through John chapter 6. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you some of the text when we get toward the end. If you have Bibles and want to look or a device that has a Bible on it, you want to kind of walk through, you're welcome to do that. But we really see a few things going on. As, as we enter John 6, the text tells us that we're getting close to the time of the feast of the Passover. And Jesus has been up to kind of his, his usual stuff. He's doing all these amazing things. He's performing miracles. He's healing the sick. And so there's a large crowd, a great crowd that is gathered around, and they're following Jesus because they want to they wanna hear what Jesus it has to do or has to say. And so all these people show up, and Jesus, being the hospitable guy he is, actually looks. It's totally cool. You can totally come to the tables too. Isn't that cool? I love that, Mark. Love it. If you need Jesus, don't let me talk in or anyone else in your row. Keep you crawl over them to get to Jesus. Amen. Love it. So, so Jesus being the hospitable guy actually says, um, we got we to gotta feed these people. Now this is a great crowd, the Bible says. It's a great crowd. And, and so I could imagine he's talking to Philip and he's kind of leaning in. I can just imagine like, hey, hey, Philip, how are we going to get these, these people fed? And the text actually tells us that this was a test. Jesus kind of knew what he wanted to do. But Philip, he starts losing his mind. Watch what Philip says. He actually says these words. He says, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have just a bite. What? Work half a year and everybody who's there because the crowd's so big could have just one bite. And then Andrew, Peter's brother, brings a boy forward. And this boy has five small barley loaves and two small fish. This is what he packed for his, or his mom probably packed him for his lunch that day. This would have been enough food for one small boy to eat for the day. And we have here not one small boy, but we have a huge crowd. This is going to be huge. <laughs> huge. Not huge. Huge. Now, hey, let me just sort of break here for a second, because we're sort of, we had a big vote this week, right? I hope you voted. I totally hope you voted. Uh, we have people in this room that if you cut you, man, you're so red, you're like, Trump's the best thing ever. We have people in this room right now, if you cut you, you're so blue. I don't even know what to say on that side. It's just like, I don't, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, and, and here's the thing, and I don't, I, I, I don't care which side you're on. Can you? I care that you vote. I care that you pray. I care that you engage. I care that you ask God about what you should do. I care about those things. But here's the crazy thing, and I think that this, this totally applies here. Because can you imagine this? Can you imagine literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people that need to be fed? And, and what does Jesus have to work with? He has five loaves and two fish. It's like, that can't get done. Here, here's the thing I think. I think that we need to understand that God is in control and God is sovereign no matter who wins a vote, no matter who wins an election. Like, we either believe God is sovereign or he isn't. And I kind of think that he is. You do what you want, you believe what you want, at least vote. And if you miss this one, don't miss the next one. So here's what Jesus does. He takes what he has to work with, which doesn't seem like much. He has people sit down. He blesses this small offering. And, and then he says to his disciples, start handing it out. So they start handing it out, right? They're, they're giving it out. They actually get everybody fed. And Jesus says, we don't want to waste anything. So take these baskets around and, and collect up what's left. They have 12 
baskets of bread left over. There were only five small loaves to start. There's 12 baskets of bread. The the text says there were 5,000 men. Scholars say there could have been up to around 14,000 people, including women and children. So the first thing we see that Jesus did here in these first 15 verses of John 6 was that Jesus fed, right? Jesus feeds. Jesus feeds. He does this. So all who are hungry, all who are thirsty, and I mean this in every way, whether it's physically or spiritually or emotionally, we should come to Jesus because Jesus feeds. Well, Rob, he doesn't have enough. He doesn't have enough to go around. He doesn't have enough to meet my need. He doesn't have enough to quench my thirst, to feed my hunger. Guess what? He didn't have enough food here to feed but just a small boy. And he got 15,000-ish people fed. It doesn't matter what he has. He has enough, right? He has enough. So doing this, as you can imagine, made him even more wildly popular. Like people were losing their minds about Jesus. They wanted to forcefully install him as their king. And so Jesus, knowing this wasn't his path, retreated and went up a mountain to be by himself for a while. So then the next thing that Jesus does is no less miraculous, but at this time, it's a little more private. And really, it's not private. We can actually all read it. Many of us have read this account over and over and over again in the scriptures, so it's not really private. But it's kind of a more personal miracle, the thing that happens next. In the evening, Jesus is still off by himself. The disciples make their way down to the lake. They, they know that the, the time has come. They need to kind of set off because they're going to Capernaum. So they hop in the boat. They, they, they start heading out in the boat, even though Jesus isn't there yet. They know that, that we got to get to this next place uh, for their next sort of thing. Uh, and it gets dark, right? They, they're getting into the boat. They're setting off, and it's dark. And they're actually about three to four miles out on the lake, heading across the lake, the scripture tells us. And all of a sudden, uh, a storm comes in. Wind sort of picks up, and so there's a lot of waves now. And it's in that rocky moment, Jesus comes walking out on the water. Oh, I love that. I love that, right? And, and it's amazing what we see in the text, because the, the text says that just as Jesus got to the boat, they arrived at their destination. Jesus got there, front of the boat, into the other shore where they were going. As, as soon as, as they get, as soon as Jesus arrives, they get to their destination. Here's the thing. When Jesus gets here, no matter where you are, you have arrived. He is your destination. He is my destination. Wow. We could, we could do the whole message just on that idea, couldn't we? I'm pretty sure I could talk for a long, long time about that. Um, so the second thing that Jesus did here in these next nine verses of John 6 was Jesus showed up. Jesus shows up. This is what he does. He shows up. No darkness is too dark. I don't care what you're experiencing today. No darkness is too dark. No distance is too far. Sometimes we think, well, you know, in the first 50 or maybe 100 yards, Jesus walking on water. Yeah, no, he's three to four miles out. Some of us couldn't even walk three to four miles, right? Jesus walked on water across the whole sea. Um, powerful. So, so no distance is too far. No storm is too rough for Jesus to get to you. Well, Rob, it would take a miracle. It would take a miracle. That's okay. We see him doing this over and over and over. This was a very personal miracle for them, right? This wasn't for everyone. And Jesus showing up is a very personal miracle for us. And sometimes he shows up to do something significant, something special. And other times he just shows up to go through whatever it is with us. Because as we already said, his presence is the greatest gift. Now I say that, and many of us, you know, you know we like thinking that thought, or maybe even we, yeah, yeah, his presence really is the greatest gift, isn't it? Here's the thing. I think what proves whether or not we actually believe that is how we live. I mean, what do we do with things like prayer and Bible study, devotional time? Like, do we spend time daily, weekly, actually spending time in the presence of our God? Or are we just too busy for all that stuff? 
But when we need him, because we wanted to show up to do something special, you know what I mean? Like, it really shows if we actually believe this. So the next day, the, this insane crowd that had gathered realized that Jesus and his disciples had left. So they get down, they hop in their boats, and they go in search of Jesus. And when they get to Capernaum, uh, they start looking around. Now, th- I wanna, this is kind of important to note here before we get to kind of the, the, the third thing. Um, this is a pretty hardcore, dedicated group, right? They are literally following Jesus all across the countryside. Let me ask you this. And I don't expect anyone to raise their hand when I ask this question. Who here, if it took you like walking for miles and riding a boat for miles to get here this morning, would be in church right now? And I don't mean riding a boat like this. I mean like this. (laughs) Like one of those. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. Like when it went from a motorboat to actually you got to manpower it, it changed, right? Yeah, like... See, like, I mean, these people, I want, and we, gotta, we can't miss this because where we're going is important. Uh, these people, like, seem really hardcore, like way more hardcore than many of us. Oh, Jesus, I want to, but it's just too hard. Like, for some of us, like, the kids were having a rough morning, and it's like, I don't even know if I'm going to make it, right? I mean, that's how we live, right? I mean, it's not necessarily good or bad. It just sort of is what it is. These people are a little more serious. And so when they find him, they, they, they start asking about when, they, when he got there because they don't want to miss anything. Jesus, if you got here a while ago and you've already been doing some things or saying some things, we want the Cliff Notes catch-up version on this. And so he started to talk to them about how they were hardcore, not because they saw miracles and believed, but because Jesus fed them. Because I gave you food yesterday, that's why you love me. <laughs> It's not because of the miraculous things and you believe in me. It's because you like getting lunch, right? You like getting lunch. And so Jesus says this incredible thing. He says, don't work for food that spoils, but work for food that lasts and has eternal life. They, of course, say that they, they want this, and they inquire about how they can have it, how they can get it, how they can live in this way, have this kind of, of bread. Um, and so for the last 46 verses of John 6, this is what they, they talk about. Um, and, and so the, really the idea here is how Jesus bleeds. How Jesus bleeds. And this is true metaphorically, but isn't it true practically as well? That Jesus bled and died for us. Now, John is the most unique of gospel writers. John's gospel isn't like the other three gospels. John, uh, he tends to look from the vantage point of the supernatural, of the miraculous. There's tons more miracles recorded in John. Uh, It's just sort of how he does it. So, So instead of like the Christmas story, what do we get? We get sort of this cosmic, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? Like, John looks at things differently. All three other Gospels give us an account of of the Lord's Supper, right? Of communion, where Jesus kind of sets up this practice. We get no traditional telling of that from John. We get it from a different perspective here in in the last section of John 6. Now, the idea that wine or grape juice representing Jesus' blood and bread representing Jesus' body could be consumed as a way of remembering, accepting, and even participating in Jesus' actual sacrifice is pretty significant, right? And his words, uh, in his words here, the words that John gives us, they're no less weighty. So the real idea pushed thrust here is that Jesus, more than anything, is the universal donor. Jesus is the universal donor. This, and this is kind of where I want to spend just our, our, our last uh, little bit here. Now, some blood types are more in demand than others, right? If, it, if there's a type of blood that is actually called a universal donor, if you are O negative, you are a universal donor. It means you can give red blood universally. Uh, I am O positive. So close, yet so far away. Right? Like, my blood, it has the O part, but not the other. I don't even know what the, it's probably like the furthest. I don't know even how that works. Uh, AB blood type is the type for universal plasma. So your plasma is kind of universal. Some of you who gave blood this week at the blood drive, um, 
gave a double red donation because you had the right blood type. So instead of saving up to three lives, you actually saved up to six lives because of your donation. Some of you wished that your blood type was different so that you could have done that or give di gave differently. My blood type actually qualified for a double red donation. But here's what I want you to see. You and I have limitations. But Jesus is not just a universal donor. He is the universal donor. And this is awesome news. Watch what he says in verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever, whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This word whoever shows up in a number, a number of times in this passage, Jesus is for everyone who hungers and who thirsts and who is in need of blood. And just like we are all in need of food because we get hungry and we're all in need of drink because we get thirsty, we are also all in need of blood because every one of us is covered with the stain of sin. Now, a lot of times when we think about that, it's, it, you know, it sort of strikes us funny, doesn't it? Like, well, how does, does this blood stain? Blood can't cleanse, can it? Well, watch this. Hebrews 9.22 refers to this Old Testament scripture and tells us this. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The perfect title last week in Jesus' body that was broken and his blood that was shed was real, and he is the only once for all sacrifice. He is the perfect Lamb of God that causes our sins to be forgiven. And so here is this amazing universal donor. And, and the great news about him is that he works pervasively. He works pervasively. There are no constraints on him. Jesus' ability to, to give his blood to cause people's sins to be forgiven, it's not like it works more at certain points in history and less at others. Uh-uh. It's, it's always equally as effective from the beginning to the end. And, and it works for everyone. There's no kind of person that Jesus' blood is more effective for and others of us that are, you know, less affected and we got to really kind of scrub extra hard, right? Uh-uh. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And it works everywhere. Everywhere. For everyone, everywhere, at all times. And so here's the good news. It works here, and it also works in the Ukraine. Amen? Amen. And because of our partnership, Pastor Taras and Hope Church have seen God work even more, and they made us a video. Do you want to see the video they made us? Okay. All right, let's, <laughs> let's check it out.
my, uh, my two favorite parts were uh, just the whole idea of partnership and prayer, right? That we can be connected uh, to each other, that we can love each other, that we can pray for each other. And then I just love all the people saying, hey, we love you guys, right? Hey, New Hope, we love you. Aw, that's so cool. Well, at the end of last January, started last February when Pastor Taras was here, many of you guys remember that, um, he, uh, he actually showed us this picture of his family. Do you guys, maybe you might remember this. Well, and some of you know this because of Facebook, and some of you just know this, and some of you may not know this. Uh, he actually landed again. He's here with us this week. If you actually want to know opportunities so that we can spend time or connect, talk to Mary Colas, because um, she's kind of coordinating that kind of stuff. Uh, we kind of have a busy week, but there are opportunities if you want to sort of plug in. Well, he showed us this, this picture of his family last year, and this year he actually brought his lovely wife, Natasha, with him, right? So, hey, guys, come on up. Oh, hey, do, where's our mic? I'm sorry. Is it backstage? Of course it's backstage. Can I just use Jeremy's? All right. Uh-huh. Okay. Woo, woo. Ah, nice. That sounds Hello, good. Hello, you hope. Glad to see you again. <laughs> so uh, this weekend, I just wanted to ask them a couple questions, um, and, uh, and I wanted you guys to hear from them. So Natasha, I'll start with you. Tell us how our partnership has been a blessing to your family. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am very glad to be here. Uh, I've never been to, to the States before, and I haven't seen you <laughs> before, but I know you. <laughs> um, I know you because I feel your praise. I know you because I mm, know your heart's open and sharing. <laughs> I know you because I know that you love God and share the gospel here in uh, America and help us to share the gospel in Ukraine. And our family is growing, <laughs> not physically just, <laughs> uh, but I feel that we have family here in America and we have brothers and sisters who praise for us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't cry, baby. Well, and I don't know if you caught the reference, but not only is their church family growing and their family because we're all family together, but their family's actually growing too. Yeah. So, woo! And me. <laughs> <laughs> Both? Uh, no, no, Both? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's my responsibility, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taras, let me ask you a little different question. Um, how has us sort of being connected together been a blessing for your church? Um, it's, uh, I have more time to dedicate for discipleship and grow new leaders in our church. It's uh, more time for speaking with people, new people in our church. It's, um, now we grow the faster than the last year and uh, last yeah. more year before. Uh, we was... Uh, Baptizing in this year, in last year, maybe six people was baptized in our church, and we started, huh? Don't touch me. <laughs> 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 She's teacher and forever say me. What I, all American understand me, yes? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. No <laughs> one Ukrainian don't understand what they say in English. <laughs> and uh, we, st we started uh, to prepare people to baptize in this year, and 12 people. And uh, today I received a message about one guy, 32 years old, and he was repented in our church today. It's cool because it's time for, for serve forever. Mm -hmm. And thank you that you give me this opportunity to be more time with my church and with my family. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Yeah? Yeah. And I, we have something for your church, for your pastors. Not for pastors, for your church. It's <laughs> some, uh, I, I can't read in English. I, I understand that it's cool words. <laughs> it, it, uh, the first Thessalonians, the first chapter to seven, we give thanks to God always for you all. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, hey, stay here for a second. So, hey, before, before they sit down, I just want to, some of you know this, some of you don't. When Pastor Taras was here last week, here, we better turn Jeremy's uh, 
thing off because if, uh, if his batteries wear down, he'll blame us, and that's not good. All right. Um, so I want to let you guys know that we actually took up an offering in these very buckets when he was here last year, and we had enough money to come in and the, that one offering to actually have, he worked for a, a missions organization called Missions Without Borders, and he kind of was a pastor in the evenings and in the weekends. And we were like, hey, you know what, if we could do something as a church to change that, we want to do that. And so we took up enough money in the offering that one weekend uh, to, to enable him to be a full-time pastor, which he's been able to do for this last year, which is awesome. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> and our women's ministry stepped up and did a pancake breakfast and raised a bunch of money in January. And then kind of our missions team and youth group pitched in to do a spaghetti dinner. And we actually had enough money come in uh, to cover his salary again for this year. Uh, uh, but, but hey, before you clap, let me just say this. Even if we didn't, like we're actually putting this in the budget going forward. It's just going to be a part of our budget uh, if, if, you know, we have, if I have to not get paid. So we, this is like that high a priority. Like we're just going to make sure they are always covered because um, it's just that important. And the work of God has increased because of our faithfulness. So that's covered um, but I want you to know that we don't want to just have a partnership because we, we saw them one time, they came here one time, you know, uh, we sent Tony and Mary one time, and so now we sort of know them, and they're our sister church, but we're not really connected, right? Or we see them on Facebook. We're, no, we want to actually be connected. We want to have people go there every year, and we want to have them come see us every year, and it costs money to do that. It costs money to fly people here, right, Olinka? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and to have them here for a week and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, what we're doing is if people want to contribute kind of above and beyond toward every dollar that's given goes directly toward this partnership in ministry in Ukraine, getting people here, having them here, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, the, the buckets are up here. And at any point, if you want to chip in, they'll be up next week too. We probably won't talk about it uh, for as long. But if you want to contribute to this work specifically, here's how to do that. Guys, we love you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Big man. Big friend. So it's great that Jesus is a universal donor, right? It's great that he works everywhere. In Ukraine even. Can you imagine that? Woo! That's actually awesome over there. You should go. It's really cool. Um, it, it's awesome that you and I can sort of chip in and be a part when we're able. But I want to say just a couple things as we land today. First one is this. Jesus asks. He asks. Whether it's helping to support his work here or in Ukraine, whether it's serving, whether it's giving blood, Jesus asks from us. He absolutely does this. And now the main thing Jesus asks is told to us in verse 29. I'm not going to put it on the screens, but I want you to hear this of John 6. It says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So the main thing Jesus asks, the main thing God asks is that we would believe in Jesus. And not just to believe in this cutesy metaphorical sense that we do, but to believe with our lives. To believe with our blood, our sweat, and our tears as well. This is how Jesus asks. Now I want you to watch what Jesus asks those who were hardcore following him all over. We're ready to like paddle a boat to see you Jesus kind of people. Watch this. In John 6 53 the text says Jesus tells them very truly I tell you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you. Uh -huh. And Jesus is really asking, will you actually receive me? Will you internalize me and my message in a way that makes it real? Like, I want you to do this for real. And here's our response, right? Like, hey, hey, you know what? As long as the juice is sweet and the bread is pillowy soft, yes, Jesus Yes, Jesus. Yes, yes, Jesus. Amen. Right? But, but as soon as, have you ever done this? Have you ever gone to a church and instead of buying like, it costs like $4 for the tiny one, bottle of Welch's actual grape juice. Right? If you get the big one, you got to take out a loan. It's so expensive. Um, and so instead, you could buy like the $1 or $2 juicy juice. 
right? It's like grape flavored sugar drink, right? Have you ever done that where someone cheaped out and you sort of like drink or dip or whatever and you're like, anyone ever done that? Or how about this? Instead of coming up and getting like the pillowy soft like it was just baked bread, someone sort of cheaped out and they're like, hey, let's get the day old. It's only a buck for a loaf bread that you have to use a chainsaw to cut, right? Here, here you go, everybody. It's Jesus, right? Um, it, we start to grumble, don't we? I do. It's like, are you kidding me? They couldn't even have got the real grape juice. Are you kidding me? Isn't Jesus supposed to taste awesome, right? Like, um, so we start to grumble even when the elements diminish in quality. What if you would have come this morning and there would have been hunks of meat and a goblet of blood. Uh Uh-uh. No way. Never. That's like a health code violation. I would never do that, Rob. That's gross. You couldn't ask me to do that. That's exactly what Jesus was saying to these overly religious, travel-all-around people. Watch how they respond to this. In John 6, 60, here's what it says. They say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? Who Who can actually do this? What? You're having doubts? You're questioning all of a sudden? I mean, you weren't questioning when I was doing miracles for you. You weren't questioning when you were, you were getting healed of your sickness. You weren't questioning just yesterday when I fed you an awesome lunch that you could eat till you were full. You weren't questioning about any of those things. None of the miraculous things caused you to question at all. But when there is a shift from what Jesus is doing for us to what he wants to do in us and through us, we start doubting. Oh, Jesus, look at the time. I I, I don't know anymore, Jesus. I mean, it was cool yesterday, but today it's getting heavy. Watch, because this gets worse. I think there's a reason that this is John chapter 6, verse 66, right? 666. Like, watch this. John 666. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. What? As long as you are doing something for me, I will follow you all over the countryside. But as soon as you want to change me, As soon as you ask for me to do something for you, which is what we're going to really talk about next week with resurrection, it's going to be awesome. I'm going to eject forever. Here's the thing, church. God never blesses you so that you will be blessed. He always blesses you so that you will be a blessing. And if you stop being, I mean, he wants to keep blessing, but as soon as we stop being a blessing, I'm not so sure that he wants to keep blessing if we just want to be more and more and more blessed. It's not how he works. Now, for some of us, this is about our selfishness. We just want what we want, and if we give it away, we're worried we'll have less, and so we don't. And, and it's interesting because if that's how you lean, if that, when I lean that way, um, I'm oftentimes way too easy on myself, and I should be harder. For others of us, this is more about capacity. We wish we could, we want to, and we're not able, and that frustrates us. And if that's your, your story, you're probably too hard on yourself. Let me, let me tell you quickly my giving blood story this week. I actually, uh, on Tuesday, I was like fired up um, to give blood. I didn't think I was going to be able to give blood, but it was just in the last like couple months where they lifted the travel ban on Ukraine because it was like I had to wait a whole year to give blood, but they lifted it and said, you can give blood now. And I'm like, yes, right? Yes. My blood pressure has been a little bit elevated, but I've had it checked a ton of times over the last six months, myself at home and professionally. And I've always been in like the you can give range, which has been good, right? And so, so going into this day, I was fired up, but I, you know, I had stuff starting at 6.15 that morning. Of course, on those mornings, we, I woke up out of a dead sleep at 3.30, and I'm like, really, God? Really? Uh, you ever have that happen? Hate that, right? So, so, but it was like, thing, thing. I knew I should have taken it easy that morning. Nope, thing, thing, people. And I'm type A. So anytime I'm with somebody, it's like, I'm engaged. I'm thinking, right? It's like, stop, 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 stop. Even, right to the moment I walked down here, I checked in. I had my rapid pass paperwork. They do all the stuff. I'm back in the little thing. It was actually right there. Um, and, uh, and then we get to the blood pressure moment, which is always like the nervous moment. Like, come on, come on, test right, test right, right? So they, they test, and I'm a little high. So they say, look, the bed that you're going to donate in the, for the double red donation, 
um, it's not even available yet, so we're going to have you b- back here, and we're going to have you rest for five to ten minutes, and then, and then we'll do it again. And, and, and so I'm like back there, you know, <laughs> trying to do, I don't know how you do it, but I was trying to do it, right? Uh, and all of a sudden, this squatty, old, mean, I can think of other things, I've said them, but it's not appropriate for church, nurse walks around the corner and goes, what are you doing back here? I said, I'm, I'm just waiting for a blood pressure recheck. She said she'd check it in five to ten minutes, you know. Well, well how, how, how long have you been? Just a few minutes, you know, not, not long enough yet. So she walks out on the other side of the paper-thin sheet, and I hear her yelling, who has this one? Who's looking after this one? And, and I'm like really trying hard, but can I just be really honest here? People being stupid is like my kryptonite. Like, it like messes with me at a deep level. So I'm like losing it while still breathing deeply. <laughs> One minute later, she walks around and she goes, well, I'll recheck you then. And I'm like, I'm still, I'm still like positive thoughts. You know, I'm seeing daisies and ponies and puppies and like, you know. So she sits down, she puts the cuff on me. She pumps it up. She does the little thing, and, and, and she doesn't get a reading. I think my blood pressure was just so It worked so well. It was so low. I couldn't even tell. No, no. She go, then she looks at me, and she goes, your palm has to be up, and she jerks my arm around. Well, now I'm like, like I want to fight now. Uh, so she takes my blood pressure. It was actually a miracle because it was lower than the first time, but still not low enough. So she's like, and she punches the number in, hits it. She goes, you can't give. You're going to maybe die soon, so here's your paperwork. See you later. Um, I went to my office and I started to send some very nasty texts to the people in charge about how we need to like still get me in to donate and I was like losing it. Um, <laughs> they, they actually did, uh, they, I, told, I told on that mean nurse to the supervisor. Uh, they did, I did for my own peace of mind have them recheck my blood pressure and I tested in normal range when they used the proper size cuff. So that made me even more angry. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the amazing news. When Jesus asks, sometimes we think that it's about us, right? Like, Rob, you need to do that. I wanted to do it. I wanted to leave. When Jesus asks, he also answers. Jesus answers as well as asking, right? So even though I was not able to give on Tuesday, you literally changed the world. And I want to show you a video. Check this out. Times know your name, I know you don't know mine, but I won't hold that against you. You come here every Friday night. I take your order and try to be polite. Hide what I've been going through with you. Look to me. Would you take the time? The day before the drive, I actually asked Amy Banbury, who comes here and, uh, and works for the Red Cross, I said, so how many do we have signed up? We had 116 signed up. Now, not everybody could make it, and there was some sickness and things like that. We had 116 signed up. So I asked her, hey, uh, I, tell me how many times a year are there over 100 people signed up for a blood drive? Here's what she said. She said, um, I have worked for the Red Cross for three years now. And I have never seen a drive that had over 100 sign-ups, ever. And we did that in Loudonville, Ohio. Even
in high schools, like their goal is like 60 units of blood when there's like thousands of students. God used you to change Ashland County this week. Think about this. 76 whole blood donations were given, 10 double red donations. We had 11 deferrals and three quantity not sufficient. We actually, John Carroll uh, actually wanted to do it, but because he was working in Chicago that day, went to a Red Cross donation center in Chicago and gave a pint there. Uh, uh, and so we actually collected 95 pints, including John's, which saved 285 lives. That is amazing. Now, some of you are thinking, Rob, you said 285, but the video said 291. So where's the discrepancy? Well, here's the deal. I actually, I, I wasn't going to be deterred by some mean nurse. So I actually found another donation place. And on Thursday at noon, I went to Worcester High School and gave a double red donation. And I want to show you a picture. Woo! So here's the thing. Some of you were like, well, well that, that's cool, but, but maybe you're busy enough. Why'd you do that? I mean, you tried on Tuesday. Wasn't that sufficient? You, you did enough. Rob, you do enough. But when I consider that Jesus died for me, that was still the absolute least I could do for him. It's no different than the person who came in, I heard this story later in the week, who had their finger pricked and their iron levels didn't test high enough. And they said, well, we can try your other hand. Sometimes that works, but, you know, I don't know if you want to hold. And they just, without even thinking about it, prick my other hand, right? Like, if that'll work, prick every finger and every toe if that's going to get it done. It's like the two ladies who came who have never been able to successfully give blood. And they both said, we're going to try it anyway. They signed up, they showed up, and both of these people for the very first time were able to donate. So why in the world, why in the world did, did, do I do what I do? Why did these people do what they did? What, is, what reason should you live like this too? Because we, we, we discovered, this is why we've all discovered what Peter and the other disciples discovered. Because as Jesus had all these people eject, who were like madly following him around, they all left. And so he looks at his 12 disciples in this moment of discouragement, and he says, are you guys going to leave me too? And here's how Peter responds. Watch this. He says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus is not just the best. He is the ultimate. He is it. And when you uh, ask Jesus, you also answer. And even though he has paid the price, he invites you and I to participate as well. And though it is weighty, it is the most incredible way for us to live. Jesus, you died for me, and so I'm going to live for you. I'm absolutely going to do that. But here's the one thing, the one thing we've got to remember, because I, there are some people in this room, man, you are committed to bleeding out for Jesus. You will give whatever, you will pay the price, you will sacrifice. Let's remember this as well, because it's not about your blood, it's not about my blood, it's all about his blood. Everything we do it's all about his blood. Everything that, the, every bit of life that we live that makes a difference is all about him. And so Jesus today, is, as we continue this journey into thinking about, reflecting on, remembering, even celebrating this last week of your life, we want to thank you for your blood. We want to thank you, Jesus, for shedding that blood for us. We thank you for the resurrection that only comes after death. There is no such thing as being alive and then raising again to life. It only comes after death. So God, today I simply pray that you would continue to steal our hearts and inspire our lives. And God, do this today more than ever. God, inspire us to live for you today more than ever. And Father, as, as we just spend a, a few minutes here at the end singing a couple songs as we close, I just pray that you would seal this work in us. God, help us to think about what you've done. Help us to, to lock in to the significance and the power that are in your blood. And God, change us forever. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.